So welcome back to another edition of the Heart to Heart podcast. And my guest today is Jeffrey A. Tucker. So he's not only my first guest to wear a bow tie, but he's also the president and founder of the Brownstone Institute for Social and Economic Research. So Jeff, welcome to the show. Uh, it's so nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I've read uh, quite a bit about you and uh, you understand that you've done a lot of work uh, with regards to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and yeah. trying to get some reasonable uh, information out there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm also very interested in actually your your beliefs on, on Bitcoin and other things as well. Yeah. But I know we'll have time to get into everything today. But um, just with regards to, uh, you know, the Institute that I uh, just alluded to at, 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 the, at the start of the show in your introduction, um, can you just tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, why you got started in that and how it got started and how it's going now? Well, after a year of, of insanity and having written, I don't know, 200 articles about the topic, starting from January 2020, I've, I've re- I came to realize that there's a lot more going on here than just simple uh, disease panic. There was a fundamental misunderstanding about the relationship between infectious disease and the free society, but even more than that, about the relationship between us and others and us and our public uh, uh, order. And that it seemed to me that what had happened over the last two years, 26 months really, was that now that was a different friend, uh, was a fundamental threat to the liberal order itself. And the only way I understand uh, a threat on this level is to is to go back to, to fundamentals. And um, I, I wish it wasn't essential that we do that, but I'm afraid that we have to. Uh, when you live in times when major cultural institutions, major political institutions, and vast numbers of individuals have simply stopped believing in the idea of freedom itself, it becomes very vulnerable. And that's a grave danger, in my view, to civilization itself. So I started Brownstone as an attempt to kind of connect all these various threads. So yeah, day to day, we're talking about infectious disease and public health, uh, but also uh, economics and also the bigger philosophical issues having to do with uh, the merit of, of freedom itself, which I believe is being uh, is massively under the attack and uh, under attack from the the partisans of the left and the partisans of the right these days. I agree. I agree. I agree that you know freedom is the most important um, thing that we have, and uh, you know we certainly can't relinquish it, and you know we we shouldn't be uh, relinquishing it. And I think that you know overall we've we've complied too much. We haven't asked enough questions. And there's going to be some consequences for that. And I think that people are underestimating a lot of those consequences because, you know, they're looking at just right now uh, the impact of maybe what lockdowns do in terms of deaths and hospitalizations and and cases uh, for COVID. But they're not really looking at, um, you know, what else the, the lockdowns are doing with regards to weight gain, mental health. You know, the big thing that I you know, I'm really worried about is the social development of young children. You know, I, I think that it's critically important to be able to recognize faces. I think that's such a, an important life skill, like, like arguably, you know, one of like the most important life skills is to be able to understand and read under people. And in order to be able to understand and read under people, you have to be able to read their faces. And children now are growing up in a world where they're masked themselves and other people around them are masks. And, you know, I can't imagine what's that doing to their overall social development and to their IQ. You know, and there was a study actually that came out, uh, I think it was late in uh, 2021, that indicated that there was substantial decrease in overall um, IQ in children who have been born during the uh, pandemic. And again, you know, I think a lot of this comes down to um, the fact that they're not able to, um, you know, read other people's faces and develop that way because of mask wearing. Uh, I have no doubt that you're right. And, you know, you talk about lack of development or mental health issues or pathologies. I mean, all these things exist on, on a gradient, you know, so Mm -hmm. Uh, you can have just mild anxiety some delayed language skills that sort of thing on one end of the pole but on the other very other end of the spectrum you've got a malevolence that um, reveals itself in things like we saw in Buffalo and Uvalde 
uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I find it absolutely incredible that in the last week of commentary on these mass, mass killings that, you know, apart from what we've run on Brownstone, I've not seen anybody mention the very obvious and salient fact of school lockdowns and masking and, and what this does to people's overall um, orientation in the world and, and their, their, their sense of empathy. All these higher uh, level things that, that we associate with a peaceful, civilized, prosperous society, which Freud called the sublimation of the id, um, you know, in replacement, you know, and and uh, as replacement with with ethics and and um, social aesthetics and empathy towards others, uh, that that has been taken away from vast numbers of people, and we're experiencing terrifying social consequences. And it's very strange to me that people are not willing to s say the obvious fact that if you keep kids out of school for a year and then mask them up for the next year and, uh, and, and isolate them in solitary confinement, that sort of thing, it's gonna have a downside. And, and, and apart from what we've run on Brownstone, I've not seen a word of commentary about this anywhere. Instead, it's crazy adults in the room saying, well, you know, clearly we need to get rid of guns. Okay, you know, well, you know, there's, there's other problems out there besides, I don't care how many gun control laws you have, if you have a, a generation of, um, malcontents, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, social pathologies, it's going to express itself in some, in some way. I mean, to me, the lesson here is to don't ever do anything like this again. I mean, don't disrupt society uh, on that level for infectious disease and pretend that you're doing good for people. Uh, you're not, you're destroying people's lives. Yeah, I, I, I agree that the lockdowns have definitely had, you know, significantly more harms than, than benefit. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think that we're going to see more and more, you know, harms in the future, because like I mentioned, you know, these kids, I mean, they may be struggling now, but in the future, I think they're going to struggle, you know, much, much more. Um, but, you know, it's kind of interesting, too, I think what you were talking about there a little bit with, like, um, the left and the right and, and kind of what's been going on uh, over the last couple of years, because, you know, if I, I've always considered myself more on the left, you know, I'm very much for free speech. Um, you know, I prescribe cannabis and very much for the decriminalization of, of all drugs. You know, I think people should be able to, to live freely and do as, as they please. And it's so odd that now, because I have that stance and that I feel that people should be taking more personal responsibility and we shouldn't have this, you know, authoritarian approach to COVID that I get called alt-right and right wing. And I think it's just absolutely crazy. And it's, I think a lot of people are just confused as to what the left and the right really mean. And, you know, maybe we shouldn't be using these terms at all. Maybe I'm guilty of doing that even right now. I don't but, know. It's, it's, it's a tendency that people want to run into pigeonhole others and, and, and use identity politics to uh, identity, identitarianism to, to peg you into a certain category. And uh, it's very dangerous because I get called right wing all the time. I, I hardly ever respond to it because it's not true. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, there's few people on the planet Earth that have as strong anti-right credentials as I have. I mean, I wrote an entire book called Right Wing Collectivism that traces the, the the dangers and evils of right-wing ideology from 1820 up to 1948. All right, so like a complete intellectual history. All right, so that took me a year to write that book. I understand these people. I understand the dangers of nationalism. I understand the dangers of racialist ideology and and uh, you know that that variety of sort of uh, blood and soil ideological impulses. Not to mention. The theocratic uh, desires and so on. I mean, it's, it's all in my book. Um, 2015, I wrote an article. I, I swear to you, I was the first person in the English language in any mainstream publication that used the word fascist to describe Donald Trump. That was 2015, all right? So, um, you know, my credentials are right there, but 
you know, people have no problem describing me as my right wing because I'm against lockdowns and restrictions, school closures, uh, and, and for free speech that, that causes me to be right wing. Uh, you know, meanwhile, you've got on, on, on the left, you've got, you know, the, the devastating move of the New York Times to, to be pro, pro lockdown. In fact, I would say that they actually started the propaganda for the lockdowns and prolonged it as long as possible probably for political reasons, but maybe ideological ones. In the midst of all this thing, the ACLU completely uh, upended its entire constitution, you know, and, and, and raison d'etre. So now the ACLU is for, for more restrictions on, on speech, you know? I mean, this is the world in which we live. The right wing, meanwhile, people don't understand this, has gotten worse. Uh, you've got them falling in love with uh, nationalist ideology and theocratic uh, dreams and, and turning against basic things like freedom of religion and, and free trade and things that used to define, you know, this Reaganite right. That's, that seems to be evaporating away. So we're going through this weird anti, anti-liberal moment on, and, and it's expressing itself in extremely strange ways. And yeah. it just flies in the face of normal human aspirations to be left alone, to get along with others, you know, to be able to have freedom of speech and that sort of thing. Or it's like we're all being sucked into this gigantic politicized machinery of, of propaganda and then being tagged and targeted. Um, yeah, it uh, seems like everyone's being tagged as like an extreme uh, right wing or an extreme left wing person just based upon one view and the view that we're discussing and again is, is lockdowns. But it seems yeah, like yeah. You know, just based upon that one view, people are are really, um, you know, um, uh, stigmatizing people and labeling people. And again, like I've been, uh, you know, I don't want to call myself a victim because I don't feel like a victim. But, you know, I have been called, you know, right wing many times. And and it's something, again, that like I just, you know, um, don't really understand too well. And, you know, from what I gather and from what we're, we're discussing here today, it just seems like the what's happened is there there's there's a big push against anything that's um you know very anti-libertarian per se and it seems that people who uh are very anti-libertarian um are uh will will pigeonhole you to the left or pigeonhole you to to the right just because you don't have their view and i feel that a lot of people on the left are calling themselves uh, left wing, but they really just have these very um, authoritarian views that are, you know, calling for lockdowns and calling for more restrictions. So it's a very, very odd, odd time. And that was also represented too at the um, the uh, Freedom Convoy that we had here in Ottawa uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, and uh, another gentleman I have on the show, Andrew Lawton, you know, he indicated that at the at the convoy, it was kind of odd because the most represented people were, in fact, um, the uh, political party, which you know, is, uh, or sorry, the um, uh, conservative party, which is you know considered to be more on the right. But he said the second most was the Green Party, which is you know completely on the left. So you know, we have a very very odd demographic of of, of people who are you know fighting for freedom per se. And I think that there is you know a very very um, uh, there's, there's a lot of confusion going around with regards to calling people left wing or calling people right wing uh, when in, in, in reality, uh, you know, they're not really looking at the entire concept of other context of the individual and the person and what they believe. Yeah, and, and human rights seem to be completely out the window. We don't talk about them anymore. I mean, it's actually an extraordinary thing um and and also i think that all this sort of doesn't deal with the with the underlying realities which is that lockdown policies that we pursued in the west you know as a sort of a copy from from the china model uh are without any precedent and as far as i can tell in the history of of and in 500 years i don't even know if there is a precedent for it anywhere in history of locking down whole societies um under the mistaken belief that you can control a virus this way. And it happened all over the world with the exception of like Sweden and t -t 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 Tanzania and Belarus, I think were the only three states, maybe Nicaragua didn't lock down, but every other state in the world you know, locked down and uh, with no advantages to them in terms, of the, in terms of the virus. The virus, everybody met the virus anyway. <laughs> it didn't make any difference in 
meanwhile, we're living with the uh, as, as astonishing carnage, among which is, um, so you would think that if you took away everybody's freedom and rights for, for a year or two, that there would be a, a clamor to get it back, not the opposite, you know, which, which is to try, try to institutionalize this. And yet that's what we're, we're actually seeing. I mean, it's, it's hard to gauge the opinions of the masses here, but there's a, a, a tremendous movement all, all over the world to centralize power in the World Health Organization, give the WHO surveillance power over the entire planet, uh, deploy software that would put QR codes on our phones to monitor our back status. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, so you've got the state now writing permission slips uh, for us to be able to go to the movies or go, go to the theater, to, you know, eat, in a, eat in a restaurant or have a drink at a bar. All the public accommodations are now being um, throttled and permissioned, you know, based so, on the willingness, your willingness to accept whatever kind of, you know, medicine the government and big pharma say that you should take at that moment for whatever reason. And we're just supposed to trust them, you know, and, and we're going to go along with this. I mean, it's, it's appalling. There's nobody in the left or the right. There's no sincere person who should ever acquiesce to this kind of power grab ever. It's, it's appalling. So it, it seems like right now that, you know, people it's, we're in a very, very strange, you know, uh, state. I agree with you because it seems like people actually want to be governed. You know, they, they're actually asking for lockdowns. You know, they're almost like they're anti freedom as strange as that sounds, but that's, how people are acting if you look at their at, at their actions it's like they want to be governed and do you think that that's because there's just a lack of personal responsibility from most individuals in the world why do you think there's so many people who actually want to be governed i think there was a a, a gradual creep of an ideology over the last 20 uh, 10 20 maybe 30 years uh which uh, for lack of a better term you call it safetyism so uh, anything that brings you discomfort, we have to get rid of. Uh, anything that, that uh, involves risk uh, should be banned. Um, anybody who feels you know, any sense of, of insult or fear or just anything, uh, any, any kind of personal discomfort that the job of the state is to take away your personal discomfort. And the, pro the problem with that is, that you don't have an adult civilization under these conditions and you can't have prosperity because 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 prosperity necessarily involves risk, you know, both institutionally and and personally. Well, and, most adults now are acting like children. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Jeff, yeah. but uh, I just, you know, when you kind of hit the nail on the head there, I, I think, because, uh, you know, all these people now, you know, you said it's been going on for, for 20 or 30 years, which I, I agree with. And, uh, you know, so all those people, you know, that were born 20 or 30 years ago are now in their 20s and their 30s. They're, they're adults, mm -hmm. but they're not actually really functioning adults. You That's know, right. they're still basically little children who do not want to take any responsibility for their life That's and they want uh, other people to make decisions for them. You know, and that's why they, they want to be governed. And I think, you know, that's, you know, part of the big reason why, you know, uh, we're in the position that we're in here today. And, you know, one of the, um, you know, more prominent uh, psychologists in, in Canada, uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, indicates the same thing. He says that, you know, when you have children, uh, you know, you don't want to make them safer, you want to make them stronger. And, uh, you know, I don't think that that message has been uh, said to many people over the past 20 or 30 years. And that's why now we have a bunch of, you know, weak adults uh, who, you know, are acting like little children and who want to be governed by their government. Uh, and you look at the trajectory of most people's lives these days under prosperity and high levels of debt. Uh, it's possible for people to enter adulthood without ever having faced any kind of real uh, stress or disappointment uh, or, you know, dangerous encounters that they had to, you know, dig deep within themselves uh, and find the volition to, to relieve, you know, to, to overcome it, right? I mean, that's, this is what parents have done to children now is just take away their stresses so that people go from, you know, childhood, uh, uh, where they're well taken care of by their parents and then and then we're prevented from competing and you know from being in competitive sports anymore 
as, as children, because that might hurt somebody's feelings, because somebody wins and somebody loses. Uh, and then uh, we've got grade inflation, so the grades are adapted to the kids, and so you can't, you can't get an F anymore, even if you don't show up to class. And then, and then you go to college for four, four years of vacation at somebody else's expense and the government's paying for it or your parents paying for it, somebody's paying for it. You still haven't had a job and dealt, dealt with the boss and gotten fired or faced you know, the com competition within the workforce. And then you graduate with a sense of entitlement, look at my degree, now give me a six figure salary and somebody hands you a laptop and, and you get on the payroll and then all your bills are paid you know, with this automatic payments flowing in and out. And, and you never, uh, for a lot, of, a lot of people nowadays, there, there was never that moment in, in life where they fa faced you know, extreme duress, you know, whether it's financial loss or physical danger or the disappointment of losing, you know, the, the failure in front of your friends. None of this has ever happened to these people. And they, they, they so they, which is to say they've never actually grown up. They've never actually gone through the psychological torment of, of failure and fear of failure and real failure or financial stress. And they begin to think that this is the way life's uh, supposed to be. Well, if that's what you believe, you're, you're in, in, invariably going to clamor for some larger controlling force to make, to ensure that that sort of mythical world that has been created for you will uh, perpetuate itself. And that necessarily leads to uh, government control of, of life. You never want to read opinions you disagree with. You know, you never um, want to take a risk. You know that that uh, could 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 lead to uh, bankruptcy. Uh, you never uh, want to uh, encounter uh, people who are different from yourself. Um, you know, you you never want to experience stress at all. And the only the only force that's out there that can do that for you is is ultimately the the state. I mean, it's your parents when you're a kid, but then as you get older, then the the, the government then serves as a proxy for. That's how parents. I see it as well. I, I feel like you know they really want you know. I saw this this meme one time that said "Govern me hard or daddy," you know, and it's kind of a, a a funny meme. But I mean, in some ways, it's not so funny because that's really what people are asking for a lot of people 20s 30s maybe even they're in their 40s and 50s even older you know they really do want someone to make all the decisions for them and make sure that they feel comfortable so that they don't have to face any adversity on their own and you know when you when you're not facing adversity like like you said you know when any adversity comes up you're basically just going to crumble when it comes or you're going to ask uh, someone else to you know take that adversity away for you whether it's your parents or the government or or whoever it is um and i think you know again you know that's kind of why people are now asking for these lockdowns and asking for the government to govern them because they're you know simply just not used to making any decisions on their own they're not used to making any tough decisions and you know making tough decisions and having difficult conversations i think uh is is really going to ultimately determine uh the quality of your life i mean if you're not willing to have any difficult conversations with anybody you're probably not going to improve uh your mind's not going to to change you know you're always going to be stuck in your own beliefs and as a consequence you know, you're not going to grow and you're just going to end up in the same place all the time and you're going to be reaching out and asking for other people's help because you're not able to help yourself yeah, I think it's, it's it really is true, and I think this also connects very closely with with COVID because um, well, you add to that intellectual ignorance, and so uh, one of the problems with COVID is people were not educated in cell biology, or at least they didn't pay attention in ninth grade cell biology class. Um, so when the government's screaming at you, "There's a dangerous virus out there," stay home, stay safe. That's what people did. I mean, it's just a tremendous amount of astonishing compliance with this incredible nonsense that never made any scientific sense whatsoever. Uh, it, was, it was pure propaganda. And uh, people, people went along with it because that is our theory of life, you know, never be infected by anything we don't like. <laughs> this, is, this is actually very dangerous to our health. And it's actually a threat to civilization itself. You know, I, I like Freud's um, this compilation of essays came out in 1926 called Civilization and its Discontents. And, and what that 
what that book is about. It's about the achievement of adulthood as being the, the key fundamental desiderata for achieving civilization. And that means uh, sublimating your primitive uh, instincts uh, in favor of a civilized behavior. And that comes through stress. You know, it's the stress of romantic relationships, which are very stressful. Uh, it comes through stress of uh, uh, fear of financial loss. The, the uncertainty is associated with uh, freedom. And you, you learn to confront those things bravely. Then that instills in you uh, a higher sense of yourself and others and, and a sense of human dignity and a confidence that freedom is better than any other system. This is how uh, Freud renders it. And so what that means is if we, if we never actually experience that stress and that adversity, then we never get tested and then we never get strong, uh, then, then we're going to be part of the problems, part of the problem. And, and the, we, the, so therefore, we never become, in a Freudian sense, civilized. And, and I think that's what we're seeing around us right now is this sort of sort of unraveling of civilization. I hate to speak so uh, apocalyptically about it, but that's what it seems to me. I mean, if you believe freedom is, is the basis of civilization for various reasons, uh, take away that freedom, you're gonna take away um, all the things that we associate with civilized life. So it doesn't surprise me to see that, you know, the growing brutality of, of our politics or of our civic life uh, at all. It shouldn't surprise us at all. And coming back to Freud too, you know, I know that um, he stated at one time that, uh, you know, they're the only reason that uh, human beings do anything is to complete a sexual urge or to feel important. And I think that there's a lot of people who don't feel important, but they do feel important when they put uh, their mask on, on their social media picture and tell everybody to wear a mask so that it symbolizes uh, that they're a good person. You know, we, we know the term virtue signaling has been used a lot lately, but it, it's been used a lot because people are doing it a lot. And I think that, you know, that's what's going on with a lot of people who are, you know, quote unquote, on the left, although I think I'm on the left in, in many ways as well. But a lot of people who are on the you know extreme left side, you know, I feel like that's what's happened in their lives, too. And again, you know, coming back to lack of personal responsibility, lack of meaning in their lives. Um, and, and to what Freud said, they don't feel important. And because they don't feel important, they need to lash out and do something to make themselves feel important. And that's why they're going online and kind of, you know, virtue, virtue signaling to everybody that they're a good person because they're staying home and, and that they're wearing a mask every single place that they go. There's that, and there's also the desire to be part of a of a of a, of a mythical group that they've mm -hmm. created. You know, mm -hmm. so you're there. The people when they put a mask on their profiles, or when they suddenly fly the Ukrainian flag, or they're scared of the monkeypox, or whatever the thing is, the the, the current thing, um, they're joining up with what they imagine to be a, a their clan. You know, their mm -hmm. group, and they they hope to find value as. Uh, through, through that uh, imagined sense of belongingness to something larger than themselves. And yeah. this is very dangerous because, uh, because in a sense, groups don't really exist. You know, they, <laughs> um, they can be temporary, but groups are also have a tendency to be coercive. So if you join them, you know, they're happy to have you. If you deviate from them, that you the hatred hatred that's and yes that's that's just the way things go and whether it's religion or the military or a political movement whatever that's the way it always is because the the group doesn't actually exist it's it's a bit of a myth or at least it's a, it's, it's kind of an evap it's got an evaporative quality it's there in, in a fleeting way then it goes away and can't ultimately provide you dignity uh that you have to find within yourself uh, but rather than try to find that dignity in ourselves, people sign up to some great cause. And, and that's the problem on the right as well, because with yeah. like the nationalists and like, you know, people, there's probably people who join white supremacy movements who aren't really even white supremacists. It's just that they know that if they identify as a white supremacist, then other people are going to accept them. They're going to have friends and that gives them their sense of belonging. And then they actually 
you know, feel better, you know, temporarily. And it's even more dangerous that this, a lot of this happens through digital media now. So it's not even through in person. They just go online digging around and find some group uh, that they sign up to, to join, but they never have to look at people in, in person or, or be a real person in front of other people. They just, they just kind of make up some nonsense that they believe in and then find their tribe, their Reddit, uh, their Reddit uh, group out there, <laughs> whatever the thing is. And uh, it's just psychologically uh, very difficult and potentially very alienating because it's ultimately unsatisfying. Um, there's nothing quite as satisfying as the dangers of life itself. Uh, but, uh, but if you live entirely on, online, you know, then um, you never, you're, you're protecting yourself from, from, from reality in a, in a way. And uh, you're not prepared to confront the wiles of the world. Uh, at all you're nowhere near prepared for that so you just reach out to the state um uh, it, it's, it's a serious problem and I, I say that as somebody who's you know i've written you know several long books celebrating digital technology and all that it's done for the world but 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 at this stage i'm not even sure if it's you know the net benefit is there i mean there's certainly lockdowns got everybody addicted to this this form of communication um, to the point that, I mean, I, I hold parties all the time. I hold meetups and groups and many people come and say this is the first time they've been out in two years. We're out of the habit of socializing. It's amazing. That's, that's, that's not good for your mental health, you know, to not socialize for, for two years. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that, that should be very, very obvious to, to everybody. And I mean, people are very aware now that loneliness is, um, you know, almost as, as bad of a risk factor for all cause mortality as even like smoking, you know, there's that 75 year uh, Harvard study that a lot of people are now familiar with, you know, suggested that, you know, relationships, close relationships are in fact one of the most protective factors, not only for your mental health, but also for your, for, for your physical health. Um, and, you know, uh, just on, on this topic, because I know that we've, you know, talked a little bit about groupthink and the dangers. So, do you feel that we are in a state of mass psychosis? And, and the reason I ask this is, um, you know, part of it, you know, I know Dr. McCullough brought this up on, uh, on Joe Rogan's podcast recently, but also too, I mean, I sometimes just, you know, think about all the physicians that I know that are, you know, considered to be, you know, great physicians, widely respected, highly credentialed. Um, who really all have just joined the narrative blindly and haven't said anything to oppose it whatsoever. Um, and that kind of scares me a little bit, you know, and, and I'm kind of thinking that, you know, maybe we are in, in some state of mass psychosis, like how can all these, you know, supposedly very intelligent, you know, academic high IQ individuals, how do they all, uh, you know, believe something that is, you know, very, very damaging and not accurate overall. You know, I've had that that thought before. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of wondering what, if you've had that thought before, and if you do think that we are in a state of mass psychosis. Um, in the case of the professional class, I don't think it's so much psychosis as it is a fear of, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a, Remediation, a, 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 a lack of courage. I mean, for, for a lot of the doctors, they, they just got afraid of being, you know, dinged by their medical boards, you know, right. or professors, uh, they're afraid they're not going to get a grant, you know, from, from the government. Um, uh, people are very protective of their reputations, which is to say their paychecks. And so everybody has an excuse. And it's actually remarkable. You would have expected to see a lot more uh, courage out there, but but the thing is that people are glad to be courageous if there's no cost, but if it involves possibly risking your your income or your status, uh, or being cut off or being fired or being or losing your next grant or whatever, uh, people rethink it and they choose silence, uh, and that's that's what happened uh, yeah. in the COVID years was that, you know vast numbers of scientists, medical doctors, and high-end professionals, you know, knew that this was all just bogus pseudoscience, but weren't willing to speak out about it. And I, I know many of them uh, myself, and it was very frustrating, actually. And then the ones that do speak out, you know, uh, they, they made an example of, you know, my friends um, who wrote and signed, put together the Great Barrington Declaration, 
Fauci immediately ordered a hit on them, you know, and and they were piled on by the by the world press, you know, just immediately and called terrible names. And is and that uh, Martin Koldorf and, and Jay Bhattacharya? Okay, yeah, yeah Jay was on here um, maybe about a month ago. He was on here, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and also uh, Sumitra Gupta um, at Oxford, but they've all suffered you know, from all of them in their own uh, personal ways as a result of their decisions to stand up for what was right. And they're all kind of, it's sad because they're on the front lines all the time. But they're, and they all get notes, all of them, notes and phone calls from all their colleagues and their profession saying, I'm so glad for you. I wish I could have done that, but I have this, this, the advocate in college, you know, whatever the, whatever the yeah. excuse is. So it's this kind of wild uh, lack of, of uh, courage. And I, I guess I kind of understand it, you know, but, but it's, it's frustrating, you know, when you've got a whole professional class like bought off, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the, the governments and medical boards and uh, deans of universities are essentially uh, buying everybody's silence. You know, you can see things slip away very, very quickly. And that's, that's what happened, at least within that sector. I mean, there's, they, they have no illusions about the reality of what we went through, but they're just unwilling to take the risk, uh, stand up. Yeah, uh, I, and uh, I understand it a little bit too. I mean, you know, certainly I don't want to, you know, lose my job or lose my license as, as a as a professional either. So I do understand that you know other people not wanting to kind of you know speak up and 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 say what they truly have to say, but. You know, there's there's a great danger in that as well, and the danger is that you know we only hear the narrative and we only hear one side of the story, and that That's we right. know both sides of the story. And you know, the best ideas come out when you have you know lots of ideas being put forth, and you discuss those ideas, you know, with with, with open uh, with an open mind, and, and 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 you tease out the dialogue, and you figure out you know what uh, you know what is the best course of action. And unfortunately, you know, it just seems like, you know, in the States, it's kind of just like do whatever Dr. Fauci says, uh, nobody is allowed to, to question him. And whatever he says is absolutely right. And we have no, uh, we have no, you know, reason to question uh, Dr. Fauci, but, you know, that's not the case. That's never the case. There's always reason uh, to question. That's how we move things forward in, in society and civilization. And, uh, you know, it is unfortunate that, you know, a lot of professionals, medical professionals in particular, feel that they can't say what they want to say, because they will, you know, lose uh, their job or lose their license. And, you know, I don't really, unfortunately, know what the solution is, you know, for that. Um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's very, very difficult to, to ask someone to do is, you know, to, to put their neck out there, to put their job on the line um, in order for, for others. But, um, you know, I, did, I'm, I am very grateful though for the, for, the, uh, for the physicians that have done it, you know, and that's why I had Jay on my, on my podcast. And uh, hopefully we'll have more and more physicians um, in the future, you know, come out and say something. And I think that, you know, with more and more people coming out, then eventually, you know, everyone will come out. We just, haven't hit the 10,000th monkey, so to speak, yet. Yeah, and there's also a problem at the, at the top. You've got somebody like Anthony Fauci who's been in his position for far too long. And he runs, he runs the National Institutes of Health like, like some sort of mafia don. Mm -hmm. And so he's the one threatening everybody. I mean, everybody knows that if you upset Fauci, he's not gonna give you that grant. He has the ability to veto these things. And he's, he's exercised that control for the better part of 20, 25 years. Um, and we, we can't have those kinds of systems. And that traces to a much more profound issue having to do with what one might call the administrative state. You know, there's this whole meta layer uh, above, this, above, the, the, that's above the political state that we elect that, you know, lasts through the tenure of every elected politician is much more powerful than they are. And you can't get rid of them. And it's a, it's a far vaster structure than anything in the political realm that we think we can, can control through our voting, um, we can't control these people. Uh, there's no, no American has any power to uh, dictate what Chachi does. And th they literally operate without any oversight whatsoever. There was a case a couple a month or two ago in Florida where 
uh, Florida judge struck down the CDC, which is the Center, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, that had imposed a mask mandate on travel. And a, a federal judge said, uh, this is unconstitutional, or it's, it's not consistent with the law. And the CDC's response to that is uh, to appeal the decision, not because they thought masks are great for the public, but then they said this, they said we cannot uh, be threatened with this kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, challenges to our authority. If, we, if they do this, we'll never be able to stand up, we'll never be able to issue edicts ever again in public health. Okay, I mean, that, that is a weird thing. I mean, what that says is the Centers for Disease Control in the United States wants to be a dictatorship. They don't want courts and legislatures to tell them what to do. So th that is terrifying. I mean, like, if we want to get serious about reforms in, in the West, we've got to address this problem. Uh, but that's like someone saying that I want to be exempt from crime, uh, not to interrupt you there, but that's basically the, the exact same thing. It's like, hey, I yeah. want to, be able to do what I want, free reign, and uh, but, you know, I can't be judged, I can't be brought to court, I can't be arrested, nothing bad can happen to me, I should be able to do what I want. And it seems like that's the position now that, you know, uh, that, that, that the uh, CDC is taking. It's like, we're going to do this, and you shouldn't be able to judge us in court. Right. This is this is contrary to to every uh, document, every piece of progress in Western history since I would say since the Magna Carta was signed in the 13th century, which was a document designed to limit the power of the king. In this case, over the aristocracy. But the principle is right. You know, there's only, there's certain things that the king cannot do, and we discovered that in the 13th century and gradually unfolded that into a constitutional systems of government. And now you've got people outright contradicting that and, and not even aware that that's what they're doing. So serious reform has to take on this, this apparatus. And I, I feel bad for any politician or, or a, a president or anybody else who actually seriously wants to take this seriously and get it done because they're, they're gonna face like amazing attacks. What we call, what I call the administrative state, or what's generally called the administrative state, has has been a growing cancer on constitutional uh, democracies uh, since since the late nineteenth century, and it's only gotten worse. And in twenty first century, it's just com gotten completely out of control. It's arrogant. It's bloated. Um, they don't acknowledge any limits on their power. The override. Uh, the decisions and priorities of every, every elected official. Um, and we're talking about countless agencies out there in the US and Canada and, and really all over Europe um, that are, are, are doing this to us. And it's, it's extremely dangerous to, to everything that we believe in, that we were, we were raised to believe in and, and, and believe now that we're free, that we have rights, or well, they don't agree. <laughs> so um, that's, that calls forth, you know, we began this discussion by talking about philosophical issues among, among the public, but th this is a serious institutional problem that, that is crying out to be addressed. And, and if, unless we address it, I'm not hopeful that any kind of political reforms or any kind of politician will be able to ever be able to uh, uh, reverse it at all. And I think it's only going to be reversed through popular pressure. In fact, I'm not even sure how you reverse it, but something has to be done. Yeah, I, uh, I certainly hope that that gets reversed because, uh, you know, we can't have organizations uh, being able to act as, as a dictator, particularly if this organization has so much power. I mean, any organization at all, but I mean, this organization has so much power over people, you know, it dictates how they live their everyday lives. Um, and uh, for them to, to propose that is, uh, you know, it's absolutely crazy. It's insane. We're going, we're going backwards. And yeah. And we absolutely need to need to end it. Um, you know, one thing uh, I know we don't have too much time left, but one thing that I did wanted to ask you about as well was um, you know vaccine mandates. So you know, I've uh, you know indicated several times that you know I do feel that you know the vaccine can uh, certainly help. Re, uh, reduce severe disease and, and death, particularly people who are, you know, vulnerable. But overall, you know, I, I don't think that 
uh, mandates were, were warranted whatsoever. And, uh, and I do feel that that's something that's, unconstu that's unconstitutional as well. You know, it is a medical procedure and people are being forced to do that. And, you know, they say sometimes that, you know, you're not being forced to do that. Well, if you can't work, if you can't get on an airplane, uh, someone's forcing you to do it. You know, mm -hmm. that is taken away from your ability just to live uh, a normal life. So, you know, I do think that it is, it is indeed being, being forced, um, you know, not simply just, just mandated. Everybody does have to work. Everybody eventually is going to want to get on an airplane and travel somewhere. So, you know, how did this uh, come about and uh, how do you feel overall about the, the vaccine mandate? The idea of, of a mandate and in the case of vaccines is always connected with uh, a perception that it's good for public health, that uh, you're not just protecting yourself, you're protecting others too. That So the mandate helps achieve this herd immunity uh, mm -hmm. because the fewer people that are vulnerable towards infection, uh, uh, the, uh, the more you're able to achieve that what's so-called herd immunity, um, uh, which is good for the whole community. You know, And that, that idea was born in the uh, out of the smallpox experience. And so therefore you need mandates uh, if people are not willing to go along because you might not be willing to go along, but your unwillingness to get vaccinated therefore puts other people at risk because you, you're, you're not contributing to the achievement of herd immunity, okay? Um, I have, I don't even agree with that, but, but, at, but we don't even have to go there because we know for sure these COVID-19 vaccines as Bill Gates said yesterday at the World Economic Forum, they do not protect you against infection and they do not stop the spread of the disease, okay? So, which is to say, they contribute essentially nothing to the achievement of herd immunity, even if, as you say, they have benefits for vulnerable populations in terms of forestalling severe outcomes. They achieve nothing for public health uh, because of their short duration and because they, they don't actually stop the infection, contrary to what they promised us. They don't stop the spread of uh, disease, which we know from every high vaccinated country. It just so happens that the most highly vaccinated countries over the last six months have also been the ones that had the highest uh, case counts of, of COVID-19 because everybody's going to get it probably several times in your life. That's just the way it goes. Sorry. <clears throat> so it, the mandates make no sense whatsoever in the case of, of the COVID-19 vaccines. That's just flat out true. So the question is, why do they do it? And I think it was just a matter of trying to acculturate the population to, uh, uh, to, to, to going along with the state, whatever it says, to signing up for a kind of uh, a programmatic you know, digital surveillance of all of us, make sure that we all have an app on our phone that, that, that allows the state to uh, uh, trace us and, and mandate things on us. Now, most parts of the world, these things flopped and they've repealed mandates most parts of the world, uh, but they still uh, exist even in the United States for things like uh, the military. You know, there's still very strong mandates in, in place and, and people are being court-martialed and, and, and not being given decorations and things like that for failing to, to get the vaccine. So it's, it's a coercive trouble. Canadians, Canadians still can't travel yeah. unless you're double vaccinated. You're not allowed to get on a plane in Canada. Not yeah. even, not even a uh, domestic flight. Yeah, and students too, right? I mean, uh, you can't go to college. So, I mean, there is no rationale for this whatsoever. I mean, you can easily dispense with the rationale for for these mandates just by pointing out to the reality of the vaccines themselves. So, this is against science. It's against human rights. It makes no sense from a public health point of view. And it's not even consistent with the, with the nature of these vaccines themselves. So the, they tr they're trying to acculturate us to a kind of a compliance mentality, even when it involves injecting a, a pushing into our arms that we don't, about which we know nothing, which is very little tested, and, and which we know for sure does not protect against infection or spread. So it's outrageous. And what it's doing is discrediting all these people. I mean... I'm not sure how widely understood this is about these vaccines. Uh, the media in the US and Canada probably too has not been exactly uh, forthcoming about the reality of these things. But once you think it through, you realize there's no basis for these mandates whatsoever. So if it's not about health, what's it about? It's probably about control.
but that itself is very scary. You know, we're, we're going to, they're going to impose these mandates and to, to fire people from the jobs and everything else for, uh, for a vaccine that doesn't, that lacks efficacy in, a, in basic areas that we assume vaccines uh, have. And, uh, and, and to, what, to what end? Uh, yeah. Just so that people get used to going along with whatever our masters tell us? That, that uh, is not consistent with freedom. I think there's a little bit of like willful blindness there going on because, you know, right now, everybody knows what, what you just said, that the vaccines do not prevent transmission and spread of the virus. Like, I think that a lot of people are very, very aware of that. So then, you know, the, the question becomes then, why are we imposing mandates if it does not prevent infection and spread? And people don't want to answer that question because then the answer does come down to, well, they're doing it for control or they're doing it for some other reason. And people do not want to think about that. They don't want to look at it. And they think that if you say anything other than, you know, people are doing it for proper public health reasons, then you are a conspiracy theorist or, or some crazy person. When in reality, you know, we have facts here presented to us that um, are not adding up. And when you have of the vaccine, again, which does not prevent the spread or transmission, then there is some other reason. And people are, I think, being very, very willfully blind and are looking the other way, and they don't want to look into some other reason or why there may be some other agenda as to why these vaccines are being mandated, because it's too scary to look at it. Um, but the reality is, is that we would have better results if people did in fact live in reality and didn't live under willful blindness and looked into reasons as to why this is happening in society. Um, and Jeff, I'm really sorry to do this, but it is uh, our hour is, is just up. So if you can tell everybody where they can find you online a little bit more sure. about. Uh, um, I would encourage yeah. everybody to go to brownstone.org, uh, Brownstone Institute, sign up for our email list. I only send one a week. Uh, but we publish every single day. And I like getting emails because that's a sure way. It means you're not going to get cut off by the third party platforms or whatever. Uh, so I appreciate that. I'm also on Twitter and Getter and Parlor and Gab and you name it. Uh, so you can find me wherever. And I always keep my instant messaging open. So I'm glad to talk to anybody. But thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for everything that you're doing, Jeff. It was a pleasure to uh, to talk to you today. Uh, I'd love to have you back on another time. And uh, you know, again, thank you for everything that that you're doing. Thank you, my pleasure. Thanks so much. Bye bye.